I think actually in nature, um, it is so, you know, nature is so chock full of like incredible, amazing, unexpected things. And all you have to do is kind of poke around a little bit and you'll, you'll hit one. Aging, none of us can escape. Like gravity, it pulls on each of us. Why do some of us age gracefully and others don't? How do our bodies and minds experience aging at a cellular and molecular level? Why do we even age to begin with? And maybe most importantly, can we do anything about it? My name is Gordon Lithgow, and here at the Buck Institute in California, my colleagues and I are searching for and actually finding answers to these questions and many more. On this podcast, we discuss and discover the future of aging with some of the brightest scientific stars on the planet. We're not getting any younger, yet. Monica Driscoll, what a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Um, I, it's always a delight to, to talk with you and uh, I always learn a lot from you. Um, I just was... Um, started reading a biography of E.O. Wilson and, and there was a couple of striking things were said early on in this, in this book. And it was the kind of advice he gave to, to young scientists. And one thing was, I, I'm paraphrasing here, of course, never study anything anyone else is studying, especially if two people are studying it already and they're competing with each other. Go elsewhere. And I, I look at the discoveries you've, you've made and continue to make and I, I seem like this is something, I don't know if it's conscious or not, but you live by this. Like you, you are, you are constantly going to the, the, the new thing that no one else has really thought about or is working on. Well, thank you. Yeah. I think, you know, I don't like exactly have a policy for myself. <laughs> um, I should, but, um, but I think I, I just naturally more attracted to something that strikes me as being really weird. And to tell you the truth, I think, um, you know, part of it is I, I try to step back a little bit or not have exactly preconceived notions of how things should work. So I feel like my eyes are slightly more open than the average bear to like, like, wait a minute, like that doesn't make sense or that's super weird. And then I, I kind of gravitate to those sorts of things. I'd like to, if you don't mind, go back to the beginnings of, you know, you're a scientist. How did that happen? <laughs> yeah. So it was, you know, really a great lucky accident. Um, really, truthfully, what I think one of my most formative experience was when I was pretty young, um, I think someone read me the Dr. Seuss book, Horton Hears a Who. Oh. And in that book... Um, there's this very large elephant with great sensitive ears, and he hears this little tiny world on a, flex of, a fleck of dust, dust, which is full of all these little who's, and they, they have a whole world. No one can see it, um, and essentially you can barely hear it. That concept of like a whole entire world inside that could be inside our world and not seeable, but somehow like, like addressable and identifiable would just like, it was like a lightning bolt. Like I was like, what? Like that can happen. And so, you know, I started doing, you know, the little kid things, cracking rocks, looking at bugs. I had great mm -hmm. things like, yeah, I remember the invisible man and the chemistry set, but I didn't really have a sense of a research career. And so I, I went to college, I started college to be a, um, a medical technologist. That was going to be my thing. And was, was chemistry and biology at the same time of interest to you? Or was, were you going down that chemistry path? No, you know, the truth is like biology was always more interesting, but, um, but the chemistry people were pushing me. And then in, um, when I was a junior taking biochemistry, kind of the same thing was happening. I was doing really well in biochemistry. 
and I got, I had an exam. I had two things wrong on this exam and they were related to each other. I totally screwed up on that concept, but like, you know, the rest of it, like, you know, I got a good grade, like, come on, but I get the paper back, <laughs> bright red, see me underline, underline, underline from the professor, which is absolutely absolutely horrifying and Yikes. i debated you know what's more what's the the more cowardly or more embarrassing thing not to show up or to show up and have to deal and so i decided that i had to you know show up and deal and i went into his office and he's like where are you going to graduate school and i was like yeah you know, like what and um <laughs> so he really encouraged me to apply for graduate school i applied um i end up entering a program at harvard and um, then that, you know, and then I just, you know, more and more in love with the discipline, like every day. You had incredible mentors, like starting with Helen Greer at, at Harvard. Tell me a little bit about that experience. And you were working on yeast, right? Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So I started um, working on yeast and it was such a super exciting time like actually Lenny Garante was was working in the Potashini lab at the time just kind of starting to to engineer um yeast and you know mm -hmm. think about these these fluorescent reporters which at, at the time they weren't really fluorescent they were the beta galactosidase reporters and and yeah what yeah. a promoter was and it was it was kind of super exciting something that's come up in in, in some of our podcasts is you know the utility of model organisms and, and things like this. And uh, yeast is obviously an amazing genetic system and it's so easy to do things fast. Um, but you you actually did the same transition that I did. I was working on yeast as well and then moved into into C. elegans. And, and when you did that, you you were doing postdoc work in, in Marty Chalfie's lab, uh, a name that uh, I'm sure is familiar to, to some of our listeners. Marty, of course, uh, eventually was awarded the Nobel Prize for uh, his work on fluorescent, uh, green fluorescent protein and, and what an incredible tool. W were you conscious at the time that this was a lab that was likely to run into this kind of fame? <laughs> um, you know, it, like I would say that, you know, I, I definitely think Marty had the mind that prepared um, mind to kind of mix these two disciplines. Um uh, you know, I was in the, I, I essentially, you know, had just left the lab to start my faculty position when all of this was coming down. And we had a strain problem, a strain crisis. I went to New York to get some strains and Marty was showing me the first, like the bacterial clone glowing green on his plate. And I was like, you know, wow. I didn't at the time kind of appreciate how you know completely marvelous and how this you know how this was going to revolutionize all of biology but um but it was way cool and marty you know would do these creative way cool things so you know definitely in his wheelhouse so so the origins of that that, that protein was from where so um so that was a jellyfish protein and i'm sure there are accurate written counts of how everything went down. But my my impression, um, just to like super paraphrase shorten it, is that Marty was at some some lecture at, you know, on jellyfish proteins at Woods Hole or something. And he just, you know, happened to stop into this lecture and, you know, happened to get the idea, hey, wouldn't it be fun to, you know, check that out in a worm? And and um, then the rest is history. Yeah, it's incredible, and it's used in, in in every aspect of biology. We we see these fluorescent proteins as as indicators of the presence of proteins, the changes that happen in proteins, the location differences. Yeah, so Marty had identified this strange genetic mutant that had dominantly inherited neurodegeneration, and at the time, you know, this was really one of the first models of this happening. So. I, you know, I sought to clone that. I don't even, I don't remember how long it took, but it took a long time. And, um, it, but when it did, it paid off, right? When I did, it paid off because um, it turned out that that particular 
um, protein, we could understand how it caused neurodegeneration and how it hyperactivated nerve cells, similar to what happened in stroke. But we, but also it was like a total marvelous double whammy because it turned out to be in this um, ion channel that um, his normal job was for mechanical touch sensitivity, touch mm -hmm. sensitivity. And so no one had that channel either. So um, I feel like I've been like very lucky in um, a lot of, you know, my science bumbling around. Um, I, I think actually in nature, um, it is so, you know, nature is so chock full of like incredible, amazing, unexpected things. And all you have to do is kind of poke around a little bit and you'll, you'll hit one um, or two or three. And, and But I feel like I have been, you know, kind of, lucky to fall upon these various things. So in, I, I guess your early studies were, uh, came down to studying necrosis. Necrosis versus apoptosis, which I guess people thought at the time was a, a more programmed process, uh, very much conserved between between mammal, ma mammals and, and worms, which was incredible, one, one of the early indicators. But ne necrosis apoptosis, can you explain the, the differences and similarities? Right. So so um, you might think of apoptosis as a um, kind of orderly program for a cell to commit suicide and be surgically removed without um, provoking any other action from the cell. So let you can envision that maybe this cell had a purpose in development, or maybe it's just better to get rid of it for subsequent survival of the, the animal later. But um, this these were some th things that were kind of selected for and programmed in. On the other hand, necrosis was considered a, a disordered response to extreme physiological conditions or um, uh, injury, something that actually wasn't really planned, but obviously could be a problem for, for an animal which is losing cells. And kind of the key feature of necrosis, um, especially in higher organisms, is that it invites um, it, the signaling or released cell contents attract in macrophages and all the, the immune system and actually end up causing um, a fair amount of tissue damage. And so you, if you want to go to the ends of the extreme, apoptosis is nice and orderly and an intended in development. And necrosis is more um, like, oh, dear, there's a bad problem here and um, it needs to be controlled on the short term or if things are going to get worse because the body actually has a has a severe response to it. Um, we were able to show that um, although necrosis might not have been programmed per se, um, we could we could get genetic models that program and then we could identify genes that were critical for the execution of that that death and um, go ahead and, and you know identify what the proteins are, what the problem was. Um, and we were able to kind of track a, a calcium crisis um, that happens in these in injured cells. And the idea is that um, understanding this process will give us um, some insight and handles to things that happen, um, terrible things that happen to humans, for example, when cells are dying and neurons are dying in a stroke of oxygen deprivation. Mm. Is necrosis the dominant feature of cell death in aging? Ah, oh, that's a good question. I say no. Um, surpri surprisingly, so this is where we started. Um, yeah, I had this like, you know, great idea that um, with age, um, cells are dysfunctional. Uh, they, they can become injured per se, just really, you know, from the inside or the outside, you know, and that, that cells would be dying all over the place. Um, possibly not from apoptosis, but from a necrotic kind of injury sort of death. This was like, oh, what a great idea. You know, no one's studying, no one's studying this, <laughs> like, let's check this out. So, um, so we go ahead and, and really the way I got into the aging field um, it was really kind of through this question, but 
I was like, well, the answer is so easy. All we have to, because the necrotic cells actually look swollen. So the easy thing to do would be to just look at the animals, but we wanted to do something easier. I was like, oh, this, you know, this has to be in the literature, right? <laughs> um, and then, you know, I, you know, start looking through and I was like, wait, you know, people were super interested in longevity genetics and for good reason. But like, it really struck us coming in, this is my specialty, coming in naive, um, to, to say like, why isn't anyone like looking at what's happening to these tissues while the animals are aging? And so we ended up doing this, this kind of, I mean, very basic study of like looking at kind of just the features, like just describing, um, what happened to the to the animal as it aged and because because it was a long time ago or you know, no one else had done it um it turned out to be really you know important to do that and to start to think about these ideas of different tissues with different susceptibilities and understanding like what actually goes wrong in the animal um as as it's aging and ultimately dying i mean this this was a a, a super important um, discovery that the contribution that you made to the aging field. I'm just just to take one step back. I mean, when you started to hear about mutations that extended lifespan in this organism that you happen to be studying neurodegeneration in, did you did you believe them? Um, so I thought people were doing you know reasonable longevity um, longevity uh, types of assays. And so I, I, I actually thought it was really exciting and cool. Um, I know that, you know, again, at the beginning of the, 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 the origins of the C. elegans aging field, people probably, including yourself, took a lot of heat about what what was the nature, uh, you know, what was the nature of these aging genes. And part of that was that it, it took a long, same thing, took a long time to, um, to clone these types of genes and by the methods that were available at the time. Um, and so, yeah, I'm not sure what else I would, would say there other than to say, I thought it was like very cool. I never thought I'd actually really be studying it. Mm. Like you were, you were ahead of me in this. You're doing longevity genetics, right? Well, and, and you were ahead of everyone in what you just described. The fact that you said, that, you know, asked a simple question, what's actually going on in these worms? Well, let's just look at them. So, uh, you know, obviously may, many people who, who study C. elegans are, are working on developmental processes and, and development in the worm is a, a very regimented process. We know exactly what cell, you know, divides into what cell and so on. When, when you started to look at this, call it noise, uh, it, that's happening during aging, does it tell you something about the evolutionary origins of aging in, in, in contrast to development? Uh, so, so that's, so that's a really interesting question. And we've, we've, um, again, you know, we kind of think about it and talk about it. Um, I kind of really like this idea of um, antagonistic pleiotrophy, which is this, this idea that um, in natural selection, you have um, the driving force is getting, you know, reproducing and making, you know, the next generation of that particular animal. And so there's a very strong force that drives um, uh, what, you know, kind of order and use and utility and importance and conservation and all those things happen. And, um, but what happens then is that the animal reproduces, everything's one, it's done its thing, um, but then worms like us can, um, can live for longer. And there was no reason for that worm, for example, to turn off its developmental programs, right? The developmental programs just, mm -hmm. Like you don't have to be neat and clean anymore. Um, yeah, and yeah. so the developmental programs wouldn't shut down. And then, you know, there's good evidence in the field now that it was like just left on, um, kind of can be deleterious because it's not neat and orderly and efficient and things like that. But the variation that you see later, I think, um, is can in part be um, attributed to this kind of sloppy leave on of the developmental programs and which also like very fascinating. 
I actually I had a I had a friend uh, who had a, a British sports car, uh, and uh, he couldn't turn the engine off, so. <laughs> we'd go we'd go on rides we'd get out the car and we'd hope to get back to the cars if it still had gas left in it so I, I think about it like that yeah um, so actually you're hinting at something I want to talk about which is that you're also very interested in the molecular and cellular processes of aging as well at a deep level and um, I, I mean there's many things that we can talk about here, but what is one is Exafors, and this sounds like a, a a great title for Netflix latest science fiction movie series. Uh, what are Exafors? So, in my lab, we are very interested in, um, you know, for example, the aging of the nervous system, and we we had a project. So, way cool about C. elegans is that you can label individual neurons with a fluorescent probe. And then you can, um, or gene reporter, and you can watch that that neuron, the entire lifetime of that neuron, really from its birth until the animal dies. Like that is so awesome. And don't even think about doing that with a human, right? So like, you know, yeah. So, um, so we, so again, like, you know, very simple, we're just looking at individual neurons as they age and, and at Rutgers, our undergrads have to do um, research in order to graduate. And so I had this wonderful undergrad in my lab, Ilya Malentinevitz, and um, his job was to really kind of count these branches and bubbles and things that were changing and we're changing at a fair frequency. So he had this labeled strain. Um, that actually, uh, I have to say this, it, the, the strain also um, that we discovered this in was literally in the garbage and <laughs> we took it out um, because it was it was a strain that expressed um, a red marker called M. cherry at a really high level. And um, it just seemed to be like too high an anomaly. And then it's like, wait a mm -hmm. minute, like, actually, maybe that that'll be an interesting thing. <laughs> like, so take it out of the trash and yeah. Anyway, I was looking at the trash strain and um, he comes into my office and he says, Monica, you know, I'm seeing this, I'm seeing this bizarre material, this m that's clearly outside of the neuron. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. Mm. Um, how often are you seeing it? And he says, oh, like five, 10% of the time. And I was like, you know, hmm. um, and in my, in with PI wisdom, I said, well, you know, I think it's super interesting, but like, I don't know how you're going to make a story easily out of something that's happening 10% of the time, you know, right. go back there and count these things that are happening 40 and 50% of the time. So luckily, he does not listen to me. And he really <laughs> wants to know where these little crazy things are ha that are outside of the neuron are coming from. So we didn't even have a, a time lapse photography setup. He came to the lab and stayed the entire night taking a picture every 15 minutes to try to oh. catch one. And the first night he didn't catch one because they're rare, right? Mm -hmm. um, then he went home and slept and came back like a day or two later. The second night, he didn't see anything, um, didn't catch it. But on the third night, he caught one forming and he comes mm -hmm. into my office with this this like crude, yes, but this movie of a neuron taking its garbage, this M cherry that it doesn't want, and like pulling it all to one side, making this ginormous exclusion and just huh. throwing it away. And and I was like, I, it was so it was another one of these moments. It was like the Horton here's a who moment. It was like the lightning yeah. went to my skeleton <laughs> and i was like holy mackerel because um as you know in human neurodegenerative disease it's now appreciated that that aggregates and neurotoxic entities are eliminated from cells and spread from mm, one cell yes. to another and this is you know increasingly appreciated as a as a core component of the pathology and disease and so same thing like very difficult to look at and study in the context of a human brain but in the mm -hmm. worm like we this is like a like again like a gift from you know the biochemist god of heaven it's like it's like wow we can dissect this incredible orchestrated process and identify you know 
what are what are the conditions that provoke it? What is the cellular molecular gear that, you know, identify how do you identify the trash? How do you collect it? How do you store it? How do you decide to throw it out or not? What happens to the trash once it gets out of the neuron? Can mm -hmm. we find mm -hmm. can we follow the other part of the equation, which we're doing um in collaboration with Barth Grant, um, who's a fantastic cell biologist colleague here and um MBB at Rutgers. And it's just um so it's like it's just what wonderful um and think, it's really and 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 so when we started talking about this um so many people in the field said oh my gosh we've seen these things we've seen these things oh and it, huh. but Ilya was the one who had the you know who wanted to actually you know use the scientific approach to identify what they were that's a wonderful story. It and is a fantastic story. So any grad students uh, out there listening to this podcast, please do not listen to your PIs under any circumstances. Right, never listen. Uh, no, I mean, you have a dialogue. I mean, we argue about science all the time. And then people get to decide what experiments <laughs> they want to do. And um, it, that's the way things move forward. So uh, another mechanism that obviously studying is clearly important in worm aging and maybe in, in aging in general is this mechanism of autophagy, which is, and, and I, I guess, you know, I'd like to hear, you know, what's the relationship with exophores and autophagy, if there is any. Right. So that's a super interesting question. Autophagy is this other mechanism that um, recognizes trash and aggregates um, and helps kind of, um, the gear can help collect and then just, you know, bring to the lysosome and, and get rid of that. What we did is we kind of crudely knocked down the autophagy genes and found that when we um, disrupted proteostasis in that way, so you think you get rid of trash removal mechanism, you increase the trash load. This actually increases exophores mostly. It's It's possible that there's a very specific molecular connection or even a switch and it's a paper that um that we're working on now fantastic oh thank you for that yeah so that's like a really nice collaboration with um with now the buck <laughs> that's great with the limited time we have there's two things i i have to mention <laughs> Uh, one is the drug called metformin, the, and uh, the second is space. So <laughs> let, let, let's do space first. You sent worms into space, right? So, right. So, you know, I'm talking myself into buying a lottery ticket now and that I'm hearing my life story because this was also a super lucky thing. Like we had, we had been interested. It, it started really, it was anchored in the aging studies. And we had um, been interested in, in how um, muscle declines with age. And this is like a uniform um, phenomenon that occurs in, in multicellular organisms, uh, you know, across everything. Um, and so we had just like, you know, published some stuff or we're talking about this stuff. And of course, muscle decline is a huge problem in for space for individuals who are in space for mm. extended periods of time because mm -hmm. their muscles um, degrade really, really fast. And you can forget about going to Mars unless, you know, something can be done about this um, in, if you're a person. Um, so, so anyway, NASA is kind of interested in this and we had colleagues, actually there were colleagues, so again, very lucky connection who were, um, um, uh, engineers really, and did microfluidics engineering and stuff. And they had worked out, um, kind of like with our enthusiasm behind them, um, this method for measuring how strong were muscles were. Right. And they, they had some connection to, um, Nate, I think it's called chef check. He has, he's, he's Polish with all consonants in his name. So my apologies, um, for mispronunciation, but, um, so Nate was, um, had been involved with NASA and they were sending something up to the international space station to study muscle decline. And they mm. had some extra space, the extra bags of, you know, free to send things up. So they just, they invited me uh, uh, to, to, you know, just, Design some experiments. Fantastic. And so we thought about a little bit what had been done. And there had been this huge emphasis on muscle, but of course, neurons are the other 
part of that equation. And so we sent up a number of strains that had markers in the muscle, I'm sorry, in the neurons. And, you know, same thing. And the other thing is people were looking at development. We kind of want to middle age is like, you know, astronauts, they're middle age uh, mm -hmm. or young. Yeah. Okay. They're young, but they're, they're adults. And so we wanted to look over adulthood. And, and so that was the experiment we did. And we got, we actually got a surprise. We did see some neuronal restructuring. That was kind of interesting, but we also sent up this Exifer strain and um, we found what was happening in, in on earth. Um, that garbage is very nicely managed by the neighbor um, with in a glia like um, interaction, but in, in, in the International Space Station with microgravity, that trash is handled very, very poorly. Like the, the either the transfer doesn't happen or, or certainly the degradation in the second cell is not happening. And that That's was a you know, total shock. Like what? Yeah. Um, but That's like so crazy. So you, you can't imagine that. Yeah. I, I, an organism that's a millimeter in size is subject to microgravity effects. That's amazing. Right, right, right. So super, 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 super fun. Um, yeah. So, but again, it was just like luck or, you know, talk about science always and good things happen, right? Yeah. The prepared mind. Um, well, let me ask you about metformin. And the reason I want to ask you about this is, is obviously, um, Many of our listeners, I think, are very aware of, of how um, prominent this is in the aging field in terms of potential clinical trials that are likely to happen soon. Um, I also, it's an FDA-approved drug that's been, you know, millions and millions of doses have already been used in a very safe way. You were one of the pioneers that pointed out that this, this compound was also potentially involved in aging. Yeah, so... Um... Yes. And to tell you the truth, I don't even know where this, where that came from, but we were, you know, we like it, anyone in the aging field, we we're really kind of um, interested in metformin. I think that part that our, um, we have a little exercise project. And um, I think the connection there was metformin was, was proposed uh, to be um, kind of engaging pathways that were exercise mimetic. Yeah. And so I think that was our, that was our entry, but we, so we got, so then, you know, we started of think, well, people don't exactly know how it's working. You could use worm genetics and Brian Unkin, the lab started, you know, both looking at sensitivity and identifying um, a number of, um, I don't know, I guess I would call them tr kinase transducers that were required um, both for longevity and for health um, benefits. And, and these are kind of famous, like, you know, famous anchor things like AMP kinase, um, which is really a core, um, I don't know, I guess I would say it, I, I on, on whole anti-aging kind of um, activity, but of course, really complicated, you know, connected to everything and things need mm. to be done right, um, balances everything, right? So that was it. And then kind of fast forward into this wonderful collaboration that we have with um, your group and with Patrick Phillips' group at the University of or Oregon, where um, we're looking for reproducible and robust interventions that extend both the length of life and the um, quality of life. And um, metformin obviously was was of great interest for that. And so in so you know, kind of unleashing this into the non-disease human, population is always, you know, there's always a concern, but that's like a whole nother story. Um, the, the main point being, we can, again, kind of take a reductionist approach using diverse Cinerobditis um, strains. So there are strains of uh, C. elegans, for example, that come from all over the world. There's hundreds um, that have been collected and they have, they together represent a, an amazing genetic diversity as much as you have among the human population. So we can model the diversity too, which is the, a key question you want to know about when you introduce a drug into a population, how, how kind of uniformly will the response be visited or, you know, how, you know, like, 10% of the people, 90% of the people, we need to know that. And in this case, um, we found we found super encouraging um, information in the center of ditis genus. So in in that, um, in those strains, we saw both like pretty remarkable increase in lifespan 
and the the um, locomotory health span. Um, but that was not the case in some of the other um, species that were that are a little bit more distant, but um, also raise the you know kind of raise the red flag that um, the genetic background and the you know kind of ultimately, as I'm sure we will really appreciate in the upcoming decade, the personalized medicine component is probably going to be something that's important and needs to start to get on the radar also. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is super important. And I know this goes across all of clinical trials and all of biomedicine. Like, how do you select the group of people you're going to do tests on? And and, uh, and and this definitely speaks to it. And maybe maybe possibly working out the mechanisms as to why some genetic backgrounds respond and some don't, perhaps. Right. And so really with kind of modern tools, you know, there are responders and non-responders. And this gives you the handle on kind of figuring out what seems to be, what are the important candidates and not, and then pretty easy to test that. So, I, I mean, I guess... Um, Many of us are thinking, wow, how, how lucky are we that, you know, we mess around with worms and yeast and flies and so on. And, 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 and maybe suddenly we realize that there is real relevance for, for human health in the future. What, how, how do you think about that? Do you think we're really going to be able to translate the biology of aging science project into actually, you know, altering human health? Yeah, so um, so really great question. And of course, we think about this all the time. And, you know, I wonder if we're, you know, I kind of think maybe we're right at that point where we were, you know, two decades ago, just looking at like apoptosis, does it, you know, is it is it relatable from worms to humans? And then it causes a revolution in biology. This could happen. It could also happen the other way. But basically, um, I feel like the track record of invertebrate genetics has been so strong to inform, you know, not necessarily on, um, uh, you know, like, okay, metformin's gonna, you know, make humans be perfect, um, you know, exercise specimens or something like that. Probably not gonna happen. But what is gonna happen is the, the associated things that we find, we're gonna find, oh, this particular compound is, is is really wonderful. And I think, you know, Gordon, I know you have a really nice example in your lab now of a C. elegans intervention that ultimately, you know, ended up being fantastic for bone, mammalian bone. And um, so these, the, the connections or the highlighting of these conserved components of biology, I think are going to translate in, um, in really exciting ways. That's great. I, I, I think that this is something that many of us in the field are are really um completely behind now and and um are very optimistic about i think we will transform medicine let's do it well well monica it's been delightful to to have this opportunity to talk with you thank you the time's gone really fast <laughs> so great to talk to you as usual yes and, and and thank you for your your discoveries your future discoveries your mentorship and uh and uh, hope to speak to you soon Yes, thank you so very much. Thank you so much for listening. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe, share, and give us a five-star review on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. We're not getting any younger, yet, is made possible by a generous grant from the Navigage Foundation. The Navigage Foundation is enhancing the lives of older people through the support of housing, health education, and human services. Our podcast is produced by Vital Mind Media. Wellington Bowler is here with me, using sign language to keep me on course and recording the podcast. Stella, who I love spending time with talking about science, as you know, is our editor. With the creative direction of Sharif Izzat and the Buck Institute's very own Robin Snyder as the executive producer. If you are listening to this podcast, you know that there's never been a more exciting time in research on aging. Discoveries from our labs are moving into the clinic to help us all live better, longer. The Buck Institute depends on the support of people like you to carry on our breakthrough research. Please visit us at buckinstitute.org to donate and to learn more.